week, uh, I was thinking about uh, a prayer. And I uh, 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 began to look at myself and years of praying. Some uh, prayers I see come to pass, and some I've not heard about them, but the scriptures encourage me that I gotta keep on praying. Yes. Uh, the Lord says, men are to always pray and faint not. And I am encouraged this morning that I gotta pray. Mm-hmm. That's who, that is one of my weapon against the enemy is mm-hmm. prayer. Amen. 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 So I began to think myself, what happened to those prayer that I've I've not seen come to pass? What happened to my prayers? Where do they go? Please turn with me to Revelation at chapter five. <clears throat> Revelation chapter five. This was one of the apostles who was on the island, the Isle of Patmos, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was sent there through God sent him there, allowing him to be there. And he had visions of what must come to pass. And in chapter 5, I was looking at chapter 5. With the elders, with the 24 elders, I, I bow down before the Lord Almighty and worship Him. And let me, where would I start? I, wanna, I just want to be short because I know some of us have something to say. Let's go with verse 5. Chapter 5, verse 5. And it says, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has come, has overcome, so as to open the book and its seven seal. The Lord here, and Jesus Christ is a lion to our enemy, he's a lion to our enemy. But unto the Father is the Lamb of God. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. Standing as if slain, having seven horns, seven knives, which are the seven spirit of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took a book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had uh, taken the book, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one holding a harp, a golden bowl, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. When I when I read, I said, My God, that's where my prayer went. All the prayer that I prayed, they're in heaven in a bowl. That's my incense. Huh? That's your prayer. Your prayer, saints. I'm encouraging you. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Your prayers are not in vain. If we are praying earnestly and sincerely from our heart, our prayers in this boat, our prayer are instant this morning before the living God, before the throne of God. Huh? Each one holding a heart for praise and worship and a golden bow full of it, full of incense running over, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers are secure. The enemy can't touch them because they're in a bowl, secure. And look at this here now. It says, And they sung a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seal, for you were slain and purchased for God with your own blood, made from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. Saints, I encourage you. Keep on praying. Don't give up. Your prayer is not in vain. God got your prayer in his mouth. As I was praying and seeking God this morning, um, I, I felt moved upon by the Spirit 
and was reminded of the concept of purity mm-hmm. and uh, how that God desires for us to be in a constant process of purifying ourselves. And a verse came to mind. Um, you can you don't have to go there. I'm just going to read through this one real quick. You can if you want to. Psalm 24, uh, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in His holy place. And that's a significant statement coming from David who understood the layout of the tabernacle and the plan of God. He's saying, who wants to have access to God's presence? Who wants to ascend into His hill? Who wants to stand in His holy place? Verse 4, He who has clean clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and who has not sworn deceitfully, So if you want to ascend into the hill of the Lord, if you want to experience the presence of God, you've got to have have clean hands and a pure heart. And those two things are required to stand before God. That's a deep statement. There have been times as a pastor, people will come to you and say... um, you know, Pastor, when I pray, I just don't feel the presence of God. What should I do? And it, there, there can be many factors for it. There can be many factors for this. So I don't, what I'm getting ready to say is not the only issue. But I do feel like it is the most common issue. And a lot of times, it's, it's unrepented sin. So when, when we have things, and maybe we're not even talking about adultery or fornication or murder or something as obvious as that. Maybe we're talking about bitterness. Something that's a little more secretive that nobody else knows about but us. And we don't even know how, how much of it there is in our life because we're so used to feeling that way or unforgiveness or lust or whatever the case may be. Well, in order to get unrestricted access to the presence of God, we've got to deal with those issues. We've got to wash our hands, so to speak. It's not a literal thing, but uh, talking about clean hands, he's not. You don't, you don't have to go to the bathroom and wash your hands with antibacterial soap to get into the presence of God, right? It's an allegory yeah. that you've got to wash your doings. Your hands represent what you do in life. And if you're doing things that are unclean, You've got to stop doing those things. There's got to be a washing of of removing those things, those doings, the way you're acting, the way you're speaking has got to be removed. So clean hands, and and that's not good only, that's not the only thing God's looking for before He invites someone into His presence, right? Not only your doings, but your heart has to be pure. A pure heart. Not only do your doings need to be right, your thoughts need to be right. right. Mm -hmm. You need to be controlling your thoughts, working to control your thoughts. And I realize that's a lot easier said than done, but most people don't even make an effort to do it. We just think whatever comes to mind and we drift and it leads us to wherever. But for those who are making an effort to wash their doings and for those who are making an effort to control their thoughts and keep their thoughts in alignment with the thoughts of God, those people are given access to the presence of God. God will not refuse those people. Amen. That's an interesting concept to me. So who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. He's not lying to himself. He's not lying and trying to deceive others. He's not living a false persona. Right? He is who He is. He's not acting. He's not lifted up His soul to falsehood. He's not sworn deceitfully. Verse 5, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of His salvation. So God is looking to reward the pure in heart. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's right. Right? Right. Purity of heart is what gives us access to experience the presence of God like nothing else. When we've made that effort to prepare ourselves to go before the King of glory, He responds to that. Turn with me to uh, 1 Peter (coughs) chapter 1. I 
I think I'm all right. I hope. Uh, I could read the whole two chapters, but I'm not. I'm just going to hit a portion out of here. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and 20. Speaking of Christ, for He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. And again, I'm, I want to get your thoughts on this, okay? I feel like this is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament on this particular topic, but I want to get your thoughts. For He was foreknown, Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through Him are believers in God, God who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. What stands out to you about those three verses so far? to me is verse 22 says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your soul for a sincere love of the brethren truth is what I make us clean that's what he's saying in truth you purify our soul the truth of Christ how to live for Christ how to live holy how to live righteous truth will tell us how to become more like Christ which one verse says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. Uh, Christ declared that I have always, uh, what he says, he said, I've always seen my father, what I've seen uh, my father do and say, I do, I obey, I obey the father, because what the father is saying is truth. So he's saying, truth purify my soul. That's what's clear to me when I hear the word of God. And apply the word of God to my spirit, soul, and body. And wash me with the washing of the water. By the word, by truth, I am cleansed. The truth will cleanse me from all unrighteous and filth of, of my flesh. Because truth will tell us that we need to repent. Mm -hmm. truth, we need, truth will tell us we need to pray. We need to uh, forgive. We need to turn from our wicked ways. And turn to a true and living God. That's what truth would do to us. Amen. So truth to me is a cleansing agent here. Living in truth. Not lies. Or a dishonesty. Yeah. So to get into the presence of God, it requires a purity of spirit. And according to verse 22, how do we purify our souls? How do we purify our spirits, our minds, our hearts? We, obedience to the truth. Right? It's not a prayer. That's the point I want to bring here. People pray, God, purify my heart. Praying, purify my heart, is not purifying your heart. Obeying the truth is purifying your heart. Truth will cleanse you, as Elder Waldron saying. But not just truth obedience to truth right you can't just hear the truth and then think that you're you're pure Please, no no you got to obey that truth yeah. obedience to the truth is what purifies our heart that's a tremendous that's a tremendous point and I don't want to just kind of breeze over that because that's a big deal because I, I feel like the great majority of us who have ever had any interaction with Christianity different churches denominations whatever the case may be we feel like we've been in environments where there was a lot of talk about love but there was no actual love. Right. When it came time to love somebody, yeah. there, was no, there was no sincere love. People were lo loving in word, that's right. but they weren't loving in deed. Right. right? That's that in, that's insincere love that's that you're right. speaking yeah. of, is to love in word, but, but not in deed. So, <clears throat> but this dynamic to me is a, is a pretty amazing dynamic because watch what happens in this process here. In, in the obedience to the, you hear the truth, you work to start obe obeying it. What are you doing? You're washing your hands. You're washing your doings. You're obeying what the truth is telling you to do. Right. In doing so, you are purifying and washing away certain things, attitudes, mindsets from your life. In obedience to the truth, you, pur you purify your souls. Now, what does a purified soul produce? 
Thank you very much. A, a, yes, in other words, yes. A, but a sincere love, in this particular verse, a sincere love for the brethren. So once you begin to start getting your doings right, through obeying the truth, God is, God is performing a miraculous process in your life. He is removing out of your mind actions, words, thoughts, emotions, feelings. He's washing you of all these things. And He's going to continue washing as much truth as you will be willing to obey. As long as you are willing to obey truth, He will continue to wash you. And as He washes you, He will wash away everything so that all that remains... That's the purpose of washing, right? right? To wash away that which is dirty, yeah. use, uh, not useful. It's, it's a removing of that which is not useful or dangerous, right? Nobody wants to eat. You don't want to go shovel dog stuff and then immediately go walk right into your house and start fixing food, right? That's nobody... No. That's not, nobody's going to do that in real life, hopefully. No, but I guess there probably are some people, but most people are not going to do that, and rightfully so. But we do it spiritually. Right. Yep. We do. We get our hands in all kinds of foolishness going on in the world, and then we come into the house of God with our brothers and sisters where it's time to break bread. That's right. Yeah. How, how's that for a picture for you? Yeah, that's not nice. <laughs> Right? And then we wonder why in atmospheres and cultures like that, 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 that we're, we're in a culture where everybody talks about love, but nobody actually knows how to do it. That's why. Because there, there's a lack of process. There's a lack of process of cleaning. They, they speak truth, but nobody's really obeying it. That's right. They're obeying. So in, in that there's no obedience to truth. There's no cleansing of the soul. That's right. So that which is, is evil and toxic and harmful to the body of Christ yet remains in each individual's life. And when we interact with one another, we know that we should be dealing with one another in love, but we can't because we still have all this trash in our own lives. But as long as we commit to this process of sanctification, God washes us until nothing remains but the ability to love one another fervently, yeah. truly, sincerely. Sincere. Yes, Sincere. not just in, in word, yeah. but in deed also, in deed and in truth. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's, that's a deep... That's truth, though. That's a deep yeah. dynamic. Mm -hmm. Amen. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls... For a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Right? We talked about this before. Love is the number one thing on God's agenda. That's the number one priority over everything else. Now there abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Right? For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring Word of God. My God. Christ. Yeah, that's a deep thought. Yeah, man. You're talking about... Um, I'm going to get too graphic here because we got kids. But that's when you think about what's actually being said here, you are born because of the seed of God was put into your life. Yeah, the seed of God being the Word of God. What God says, what God thinks, well, yeah. was imparted into you. And that produced a new being, a new creature, a new man, the, Old, the New right. Testament talks about. A new being, a new you, a transformed you. That's, right. That's the goal, right? The Word of God produces that. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Now going into chapter 2, I want to read some verses there as well because it continues the same thought. I want to get your thoughts here. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, so he's linking what he's getting ready to say to what he just said. Therefore, because we know this dynamic that was just mentioned. Therefore, putting aside all malice, and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. 
like newborn babies, long for the pure milk, pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. What are your thoughts on those three verses? With those things in our life, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, envy slander, and, and such like things, it literally hinders our growth. Amen. Our spiritual growth, our emotional growth, our mental growth. It hinders us in growing in all of those areas when we're still hanging on to this. You cannot grow in love when you're still dealing with malice in your heart yeah. towards somebody else. That's right. right. You, can't, you can't grow in the love of God until you're willing to wash your hands of that malice. I refuse to hold on to this anymore. And once you make that choice and you begin to make the efforts to remove that out of your life, then the grace of God comes and the Spirit begins to cause you as a newborn baby to grow up into the love of God. But you can't grow without being willing to wash yourself of a lack of love, basically. Bitterness, envy, malice. That's, that's powerful. Anything else stand out to you about those verses? Yeah, as uh, my brother Devin was saying, I remind me, it kind of reminded me of my mother who said to me when I was a baby, that was a greedy baby for milk. <laughs> now we talk about a pure milk. Her milk was pure milk. It helped me to grow. It 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 set me up for a pure growth. Now in this world now, I understand that they got another type of milk, what they call milk formula, with all this mixture, additive stuff they add to it. It caused uh, uh, bloating, a gas in the a baby. It caused all kind of problem in baby. That's not pure milk. But the mother milk is the purest milk you're going to ever get. And that's what the Word of God said. That milk will help us to grow like a tree that is planted by the rivers of living water, bearing fruit, more fruit, and mud fruit. The Word of God is pure to it. 100 percent. Plus pure. But there's a milk in the world that are not pure because they got all this junk added to it. Yeah. It look good, tastes good, it look like milk, but it's not milk. Mm -hmm. Only the word of God is true milk. Amen. Amen. What is the word of God? If, if the word of God is what causes us to grow to that degree and, and it can't be contaminated, what then what is the word of God? Right? If I say the Word of God, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Just blurt it out. There are no wrong answers. The Word of God. Jesus. Conscience. Conscience. Okay, Jesus, Scriptures, conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really good. I'm, I'm actually really surprised by that. Because that is a good encapsulation. What I was expecting was 95% of people to say the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> right? You say the Word of God, and, and, yeah. and, and that is, it is. The Word of God is in here, but it's not limited to this book. Right? That's, I think so many people are limited in their spiritual growth because they think the Word of God is only what is written in this book. When God speaks to your conscience, what is that? That's the Word. That's the Word of God. That Word of God is even more powerful yeah. for you as an individual. Right. That Word of God is more powerful than, for you than what is written in this book. Because it is God taking what is written in this book and applying it to your specific circumstance. It's like a tailor who tailor makes a suit for you, right? You go to you go to K and G and you get one of these suits and it's all baggy in the wrong places and it don't fit and it looks it looks like a seventy five dollar suit, right? But you go to a tailor and you pay a thousand dollars and get a tailor made suit and it fits you perfectly. When God speaks to your conscience, what He's doing is He's taking the principle of this book and he is tailor he's tailor making you a suit to wear and he's telling you here is how you can wear my word and that is just as much the word of God as what is written 
Right? But people, we don't, most people never even delve into that in their Christianity. They come to, they come to church, they talk about a few verses, yeah. they go on about their life, they're never they taught to be sensitive to the Spirit, they're never taught you better listen to what is being, what's going on in your conscience, because what's going on in your conscience is God trying to apply this to you. Right? right. right? Beyond just an intellectual knowledge. He's trying to make a spiritual transformation. He's trying to tailor make you to a garment of His Word that will protect you and warm you and keep you and guide you. So all of those. And Jesus is the perfect epitome of the Word of God. Amen. Both that which is spoken and that which is lived. He lived. You already referred to it. Jesus said, I don't do anything that I didn't see my Father do first. And I don't speak anything that I didn't hear my Father speak first. Well, what is that? The Word. God speaking to him, he devoted his entire life to doing nothing but what he heard from God. Amen. And so he lived out the word of God to the degree Amen. that the apostles called Jesus yeah. the word of God. Yeah. Oh. 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 That's, that's a powerful yeah. dynamic. That brings up an interesting dynamic. The first time I read through these verses, I don't know if anybody really got anything out of it. You're like, we're, we're reading and, and it really doesn't mean much. But then, we okay, we read the next few verses. We talk about what the Word of God actually is. That it's more than what you initially thought. Remember, we have that discussion. Then you come back to verse 24 and 25 and read it again. And it makes a whole different, it's a whole different understanding. Right? Did I lose y'all? And no, all that jumping around? Right. Yeah. All flesh is grass. grass right. And it's glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. All right, your flesh, what you're doing in your own power, your own ability is like grass. It, it, it's going to fall and fade away. It's going to die eventually. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Right. So when the word speaks to you and the word ministers to your conscience, He's building something in you that will last forever. Right. Hence, yeah. eternal life. That's right. what, what you have built is going to fade away and die right. and cease to exist. But the Word of God that you have responded to is going to create such a life that God is not going to let that life fade away. He's going to save that life and give life to that person for eternity. But what's the difference? That life is no longer its own. It's been bought with a price. That life has been molded and shaped and empowered by the Word of God. And so what is shaped by the Word of God lasts forever. What's shaped by the human mindset will die and pass away. Yeah, exactly. Amen. That's, that's a lot deeper understanding than, right. Right. than just surface level reading. You're, you're, you don't even know it's there yeah. until God puts you in a situation yes. and forces it to the surface to yes. reveal that it's there. Yes. Let, let's talk about her situation. Thank you for sharing that because yes. that, that's what we need to get to. What happened in her situation? She, she did something. She didn't even know there was an issue there. She did something, said something in a way that somebody brought to her attention that, hey, that's not exactly right. Well, immediately the conscience kicked in, yeah. right? And then the Word of God comes through the conscience. Yeah. And the Word of God begins washing. Yeah. There was something there that you didn't even know was harmful in your life. And here it's been exposed. Now I'm going to wash it by me moving upon your conscience. I'm going to purge your works. Right? And you responded the right way, the, the perfect way to humble yourself. Yes, I was wrong and apologize to that person. You made it right. And so in doing so, you washed your, your hands. You washed clean hands of pure heart. Now you have a right relationship with God. So guess what? Two or three days later, another situation like that is going to happen again. And it's going to be over and over and over. And in every situation, whereas we think nothing significant is happening, these little things are God's way of infusing our lives with His Word, washing us by His Word, and preparing us for eternal life. That's it's that practical. Like we're talking about super deep spiritual concepts today. But these, these concepts are practical. Ultimately God is looking to fix how we live. Our actions, our words, our thoughts. It's super practical. It's deep and as simple as that. I just wanted to say that. Yes, that's very important. 
<laughs> because it gets you out of the cycle of condemnation. Okay, I've used this analogy for this dynamic in the past. Your pain, the sense of pain on a hot stove. Right? If you nobody likes pain, right? Is there anybody in here that just runs around saying, Let me see how I can hurt myself today to, to just because I like it. I enjoy sheer pain, right? Something's wrong with a person who does that. Nobody enjoys pain. But if we didn't have the sense of pain, we would be way worse off than normal. Right? Because if, if I stuck my finger in a pot of boiling water and I felt no pain. The, nerves come. The, the flesh will go. Yeah. Eventually, it will, it will it will boil and burn, and then bacteria and infection sets in, and I will literally end up losing a finger if I don't. At some point, because of the pain, yikes! Right, and it hurts for a moment, but in removing it, I have saved myself from so much damage. So, in that respect, the pain is good. The conviction is a good thing. If responded to the right way, conviction is a blessing to us. The well, was that God's way of punishing Jonah or God's way of blessing Jonah? Blessing. Three days in the belly of a well. <laughs> That's tough, but it was God's mercy. Yeah, grace. Because if, if Jonah would have kept running from God, he was running from God, God told him to go do something, and Jonah said, uh-uh, I ain't doing that, went the other direction. And God sent a whale, a storm, and swallowed him up. God, that was God's mercy. And, and in that mercy, Jonah repented, and then went and did what God told him to do. So that pain, that pain, where would Jonah have ended up if God didn't even bother to trouble him and just let him go on about his way? So we don't know how bad Jonah's situation was. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know because it never would have been written in the Scriptures. How many times has that happened? That's a deep thought. <laughs> but that pain is a good thing. And that's what James brings up as a very important point. We need to view pain... Don't get mad at yourself because God corrected you, right? Because every one of us, there, there, till the day you die, I don't care how perfect and holy you get, there will always be some area which God is working on you in. Always. Right? I don't think anybody ever completely arrives. I think we get to a point where we're not murdering, we're not committing adultery, we're not fornicating, but then for the rest of your life, once you've got all the sins taken care of, then He starts working with the weights. Right? Because it's the weights and the sins. Lay aside the weights and the sins which does so easily beset us. Hebrews 12. So now that we've got sin taken care of, now God's still going to use our conscience to deal with us on weights. Things that we're not really going to lose our salvation over, but at the same time, we're not becoming the person we should become. It's holding us back in a lot of respects. And God's going to continue to deal with us in those areas. And so we need to embrace conviction. Embrace, embrace correction. Thank God that He had enough mercy to show me that this was an issue. I didn't even know that thing was yes. there. Yes. Yes. And now here, He has revealed it to me so I can wash myself, so I can remove my hand from the boiling pot of water and get myself straight before this is a really bad situation. That's a great point, Brother Jack. Alright, verse 4. And coming to Him, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. That's pretty much everything in life. God sees things and gives value to things that most human beings get value nothing about it. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the Word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Wow. Deep stuff. 
What stands out to you there? We got to start seeing things through God's eyes, seeing people through God's eyes, right? Because this is what they were doing. They looked at Christ and said he has no value. But when God looked at Christ, he said he's the most valuable human being I've ever created. He's choice. He's precious in the eyes of God. So we got to start seeing things and people and situations and circumstances, right? You're, you're thinking a bad situation you're in right now is just, it couldn't get any worse. And God's looking at it and saying, this is what's going to define your life. That's right. This is what's going to change you and transform you to become the person that you need to become. To, to you, this situation has no value. But to God, this is a very valuable circumstance because it's going to cause you to become who it is He wants you to become. That's, that's an, we need to keep mindful of that dynamic. God does not see things like most human beings. Amen. Somebody else? I'm <laughs> Um, I was going to say I was going to say um, wow. the word the written word is not mm, it is his word still but the real word is Jesus Christ I was looking at Luke chapter hey, I think it's Luke chapter 4 it is when the Lord was with his uh, disciples and they were saying, we found who, is, who was written in the law of Moses. The, the word is to show us Christ, but not to rest on, one, on that word. You know, you know what I'm saying? But Christ is the word. Christ will speak to us daily. That's why it says, uh, I deny ourselves, take my cross and follow him because he won't talk to us. The written word not going to talk to us, but Christ will talk to us. The written word point us to Him. If I can find that where He was talking, when He says, uh, but when I stepped out, uh, 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 nah, I missed, I missed it up. Um, when He was staying to Him from Galilee, um, yeah. Okay, so John, John. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not that one. Um, I had it the other day uh, because I went out there. That's what happened when you uh, I missed the word. <laughs> and when you get older too, you know, you bring the idea as, as I should be. But what I'm saying though, the real word is Jesus Christ then. That's what I'm saying. He's, he's the one that we're going to really listen to. Because I remember on the Mount of Transfiguration when his uh, three uh, disciples were there. And when they saw uh, Moses and Elijah, uh, Peter got excited. Well, Lord, shall we build three? And, it's, and the Lord just come out and says, no. He like was saying, no. This is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. I want to hear him and not Moses and Elijah. Because he's the word of truth. He's truth and he's the light and he's the way. I want to hear Jesus Christ, the living word. If, if, if I'm making sense. He's the one that we got to listen to. Speak to our conscience daily. He, he will speak to us. Jesus Christ will. As long as we follow him though. But if you're not following him, he can't talk to us. got to follow him. But he's the one that the Lord God set for us. Our example to follow. As, 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 uh, the scripture said in first, third, first, John says, we have seen him, we have touched him, and handled him, the word of life. That's what he is to us. The word of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's my two sin, really. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the exact dynamic going on in 7, 8, and 9 here that we, or, I'm sorry, se uh, 6, 7, and 8, that we just talked about yeah. is they rejected they rejected Christ. Mm. And when you reject the Word of God, you reject Christ, who is the Word of God. You, what you rejected, God then takes and makes the cornerstone. That's significant yeah. because yeah. the cornerstone is the most important building block in, right. in, in, in the, the entire building. building. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so what men cast to the side and said, we don't even want to use that in our life. God said, I'm going to build everything that I'm building is going to be built off of him. He's the most important piece. Right. And so then it says, for they, verse 8, for they stumble because they are disobedient right. to the word. When the word of God comes, they disobey it. They don't, they don't uh, apply it to their lives. And this is the doom to which they were also appointed. The scripture allows. Remember, I'm going to go back in the Old Testament. Uh, don't read the Old Testament. David had a hunger and a desire to build God a house. And the Lord looked at him and says, Listen, man, you can't build a house for me because your hand is bloody. You can't build a house for me because I'm, I feel heaven and earth. You can't build a house for me, David. But um, your seed will. And we are a building blocks, a building a spiritual house for the Father to come in and worship. We are the, He is coming into us, into this a building to worship with us. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you know what I'm saying? We are living stone, live stone, building up a spiritual house unto God the Father to come and dwell. If you can remember the children. Israel, when they had a, a build a tent, that tent was for a meeting place where the Lord God would come down and meet with them in that tent. And that's what we are now today, the living tent or the living house of God where he comes and dwells with us. His presence is in there with us. So he says here, yeah, uh, you also are a living stone uh, being built up in a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. To offer up a spiritual sacrifice. We, 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 are the, we are sacrifice because we have mortified and crucified and destroyed the flesh and built up a spiritual house unto God for him to come in unto us. To offer up spiritual sacrifice, I said to God, through Christ. And it's only through we being obedient to the word of God. And it said, the word says, I repent. I be baptized in Jesus' name. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Live righteous and live holy. That's a spiritual house we believe for God to come and dwell in. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm making this sense here. Mm -hmm. I went back to the Old Testament. That has a lot to do with this. I mean, you know, this too. Yeah, in this context, yeah. I, I think, and this is an assumption on my part, but I feel like they were they were building their own kingdom. Right. Yeah. Right? They were taking what God started, but then they took it over and started doing their own thing. Yeah. And then Jesus comes and, and tries to tear down all, everything that they had built, a following unto themselves, and get people back reconciled to God. So I feel like in, that's the context of what he's saying is, the stone, what I'm trying to build, I sent a stone to build, and you were building your own temple. That's right. And you rejected what I sent to build upon. And so the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. In other words, I'm just going to destroy. That's eventually what he did is he destroyed the whole Jew's way of life in AD 70. Destroyed everything about them. Temple and everything was yeah. torn down That's flat to the ground. Yeah. And now God's built up. A, a, a temple. We are the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he doesn't have physical temples right. anymore. We are. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? That's what the New Testament teaches us. And I feel like that's what he's referring to here. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of it. I'm going to read the, uh, four more verses here, okay? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. We're still talking about purity. Yeah. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
Great. Purity. Purity of heart. And and that's and this passage talks about the rewards of it, why it's necessary, and the rewards of it. And um I hope that's a blessing. Will you help me pray? Yes. To this end, concerning what all the things that God has spoke to us this morning, and that we not just kind of gloss over these things, but that we receive them in our spirits. Amen. Father, we come before you thankful, first and foremost, thankful for what you have spoken to us, for your guidance, for your direction, for how you have ordered our steps this morning, for how you have ministered, giving each person a piece of the puzzle. And Father, now that we look back on this service, we see the things that you are speaking to us, and we are so grateful for them, God. Our hearts and our minds be open to receive the seed of your word that your word father would take root in our hearts and in our minds that your word would purge us that it would wash us God as David wrote purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow purge my heart my mind by your word oh God your word that you're speaking to my conscience every day you are working to wash out of me everything which hinders me and holds me back and I thank you for that work. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy and that you care enough to correct me for those things, God. For you are trying to teach me how to live the abundant life such as Christ lived. A life full of joy and peace in spite of circumstances, God. That is what you're trying to produce in us in this life and in the life to come. Eternal glory, God. You're so good to us, Father. And I pray, Father, that this word, this seed that has gone forth this morning would take root in our hearts and in our minds that we meditate upon it, that we pray, that we seek you concerning these things in the days to come, that we may be transformed to the image of Christ Jesus, your Son, that we may go and do likewise also, Father. And we ask all of this by your grace and your mercy to be done for a testimony of your good works that the world may see. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.